Hey everybody, today Rado runs through Lord of the Rings The Card Game, which is a very popular, very successful living card game. And if you don't know what a living card game is, basically the way these work is, when you buy the game, you know, it comes in this box, and it's a full, complete, standalone game. In this game, it's uh, Adventure and Peril in Middle Earth for one to two players. So, it's totally standalone, but what the publisher Fantasy Flight has been doing almost like clockwork, month after month after month, ever since the game came out in 2011 is, they release all these little expansion packs like the Hunt for Gollum and Conflict at the Karak and stuff like that. And you can buy those or not because you have a fully standalone complete game you can play over and over and over again, but you can buy these little expansion packs and add more characters and more items and more monsters and more quests and all kinds of stuff. So the game is living. It's constantly evolving, constantly adding new stuff if you want to keep paying on a monthly or quarterly or however often you want to buy these little expansion packs. You can see I've got about five of them right now, five, but there's tons, 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 tons more. In fact, I mean, the game is so popular that the publisher Fantasy Flight has actually gone and re-released some of these in like alternate nightmare mode versions. There's, there's a ton of expandability. Once you get this game, if you enjoy it, you can keep playing it for years and years and years and constantly keep having it expand and live as you buy new stuff. Although this run through today, I'm really going to be focusing just on the experience out of the core box. With a couple of caveats, I actually have had to throw in a few cards from some of the expansions, and I'll explain that as I go. But let's actually start talking about how to play the game. Now, in this game, one or two players, you can play it solo. Uh, normally, you're going to want to play it with somebody. You can actually play with three or four players as well if you buy a second copy. If you, if you buy two copies of the base game, you have enough cards to be able to play a three or four player game and the game works fine as it scales up. In fact, in some ways, the game gets easier often when it scales up, particularly in the adventure I'm about to demonstrate. Now, the way the game is set up, I'm going to be doing a two player game today. And here I am over here. I've got a party of three dwarves, Gimli, Thalon, and Glowen. And Jen has a party of uh, uh, Eowyn and uh, Dunhir, two Rohan heroes, and Glorfindel the Elf. All right, so, and each of us have built a deck of 50 cards or more, 50 or more cards that are, you know, have all kinds of allies in here and equipment in here and events that we can call upon to deal with the various dangers we are going to face that the game throws at us. And now, that's the first thing I really got to mention about this game. A big part of it is constructing your own deck, you know, picking heroes that have strengths and weaknesses that complement each other, you know, to make this little party of three heroes, and then building up a deck, um, you know, from all the cards that are available to you that works well with these heroes. And, you know, while you're at it, probably ends up specializing in certain things like attacking or questing or what have you. Now, to give a full idea of what this game plays like, I have gone on ahead and I've built for this run through um, a 50 card deck for me and a 50 card deck for Jen. And this is where I've had to cheat a little bit because the base game really doesn't come with enough cards to do any kind of significant deck building. I mean, you can, but not really leveraging the game to its full effect. So I've actually had to go, I've actually dug out some cards from uh, some of my expansions and thrown them in here as well. So some of the cards you might see me play wouldn't necessarily come in the base game, but still, I, I figured it was more important, because normally with the base game, what you do is it comes with 30 pre-made, or I'm sorry, four pre-made decks that have 30 cards in them. And the game, you know, suggests when you first start playing, just use these pre-made decks we've made for you. But really, after you get to know the game, a big part of the game is constructing your own deck. And to do that well, you really either need to buy another copy of the base game or buy some expansion so you have a little bit of flexibility. And, and that's where a lot of the fun comes in. There's not much fun deck building in the base game, at least in my opinion. Other people might disagree. So anyway, as I, I, long story short, as I play, you're going to see a couple cards maybe come out that wouldn't be from the base game. But all the bad guys, all the nasties I'm going to be coming up against, all come from the base game. Okay? All right. So let's start playing. Well, I, all right. Well, what are we going to play today? The base game comes with three different quests. And what are they? They are... Um, journey along the uh, the Anduin and I think passage through Mirkwood. 
But I'm not playing either of those adventures. I am playing right here, Escape from Dol Gord, uh, from uh, from Dol Guldur, which is just about the hardest adventure that has ever been released for this game, including all the expansions that have come out over the years since it was first released. This is a very, very nasty, tough, tough adventure to beat. It's probably going to completely work me over, but I went ahead and chose it because it really is pretty good at showing off a lot of the different functions that the, that the game offers. If I played a, an easier, one of the other easier adventures that came out of the box, I might not be able to show you stuff like, um, you know, guarded treasures and stuff like that. So I chose this one just because it, it provides a lot of variety. So what's going to be happening today in our adventure? You can see this adventure is actually, uh, the adventures usually are composed of three acts, three stages. Sometimes there's more. I think maybe there's some that are even less, but you know, generally there are three. And so this adventure is going to start with the Necromancer's Tower. The Lady Galadriel of, uh, 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 oh, I don't know how to pronounce my Tolkien stuff, uh, Lauren. Lorian has asked you to investigate the area in the vicinity of Dol Guldur. While doing so, one of your allies was ambushed by orcs, captured, and is now held in the dungeon cell. So now that is the beginning of our adventure. And so we'll have to deal with this card, at which point we deal with Act 2, um, which is Through the Caverns, and then finally Act 3, Out of the Dungeons. So. That's the situation we're in. And by the way, I guess I should say spoiler alerts, but this is not a huge story-centric game. So, uh, you, you know, maybe, I, I don't, and also I don't think I'm going to get very far into this adventure. So, you're I, maybe in the extended I'll make it, if I get lucky, through to the second act. We'll see how it goes. But anyway, so, there's definitely some setup that has to be done here. Search the encounter deck for the three objective cards and place them in the staging area. Also place the Nazgul of Dol Gordur face up, out of play, alongside the quest deck. Then shuffle the encounter deck and attach one encounter to each objective card. Now, I've already done that ahead of time. These are the three objectives. Although, actually, before any of this stuff happened, this is the encounter counter deck. Um, so when I chose this adventure, the first thing I had to do is I had to look at these icons over here, which show the, um, that the encounter deck is comprised of three types of cards. Dol Gordur cards, spider cards, and orc cards. That's what these three icons are. So the game comes with tons of different uh, enemy encounter, uh, you know, uh, uh, treachery cards. And they all have different icons on them, like, you know, this is, uh, you know, one of the wilderness cards, and, and over here is, you know, there's a bunch of different cards. And from all these enemy nasty cards, I was supposed to take all the ones that have these three icons, shuffle them up, and make an encounter deck, which I've already done. And then after I did that, this thing points out, hey, take out the three objective cards that came from the Dolgor deck, which I've done, which is the Dungeon Torch, Gandalf's Map, and the Shadow Key. So pull them out, and also pull out kind of the boss, Nazgul of Dol Gordur, uh, pull him out as well. And now, these three um, objective cards are what we are trying to find. Because we need Gandalf's map, and we need the Shadow Key, and we need the Dungeon Torch to be able to get out of here alive. But, these things aren't just sitting around. We have to go and win them. So, that's why it says... Um, right. Uh, place the objective cards, place them in the staging area, shuffle the encounter deck, which I've done, and then place one encounter on each uh, objective card. So I place an encounter on this, and it is the Endless Caverns, which is a dungeon. And, um, oh, and what do you know? Doomed surge one. So that means Doomed is an effect that whenever a Doomed card comes into play, we have to increase our threat. So we started at 29, which I'll talk about in a second, but now we have to bump up to 30. Uh, one handed filming. All right. So. That's cut. We're doomed. We've got we um, because this threat counter is uh, basically a ticking time bomb for us. When we hit 50, we lose because we're so threatening that Sauron himself will come out and uh, you know wipe us out or something like that. So, and it's a surge, which means we're going to have to draw one additional card, unfortunately. But anyway, I'll keep on putting these out. So Gandalf's map is guarded. Is somewhere at the tower gate. All right, and the shadow key is. Okay, it is guarded by a cavern guardian and doomed one. Okay, great. We have to increase our threat yet again. 
So now we're up to 31. That's not a good start. But like I said, this, uh, you know, the game takes no quarters. And remember, because of the surge, I have to draw one additional one. And so it is the uh, Necromancer's Reach. Oh, and this is a treachery card. Now, there are three types of cards in the bad guy deck. Locations that we can travel to, enemies that we can fight, and treacheries that just pretty much hit us right away. So this treachery, the Necromancer's Reach, hits us right now. When revealed, deal one damage to each exhausted character. Ah, that's, and you can see this came from the Goblin deck. That's very lucky, because since we're at the beginning of the game, none of my characters have been exhausted, i.e. tapped. So, hey, that treachery didn't hurt us. At least we got a little bit lucky there. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So, we have set ourselves up. We've got our three objectives, and one's hidden in the Endless Caverns, one's somewhere near the Tower Gate, and one is guarded by this nasty undead creature. So... Now, we've done the setup on side 1A of the Necromancer's Tower, and now we flip over to side 1B, and um, when re there's more. When revealed, randomly select one hero card from all the heroes controlled by the player, and then turn it face down. That hero is now considered the prisoner. Because remember, one of us gets captured right at the beginning. It cannot be used, cannot be damaged, does not collect resources uh, until it is rescued as instructed by card effects later in the quest. The players, as a group also, cannot play more than one ally each round. And we cannot advance to the next stage of this quest until we found at least one objective card. So, you know, with the next stage of the quest, stage two, even if we did everything we need to do it, we cannot move on to stage two until we either find Gandalf's map, the Shadow Key, or the Dungeon Torch. So we got to find one of those. And in addition to that, we have to make, as you can see this number right here, nine progress on the Necromancer's Tower quest. So we have to make nine progress and find one of those things before we can move on. That's this, and we are limited because we have to lose somebody now. Let's see, randomly. Uh, eeny, meeny, miny, moe. Catch a tiger by the toe. If he hollers, let him go. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe. Okay, sorry, done here. You've been captured. So, unfortunately, one of Jen's three heroes is already gone. That is making things even worse. Okay, and we can only summon one ally per turn, which is... But even worse because we've already lost one of our core heroes. That's the situation we find ourselves in. And now, let's see if we can rescue Dunn here, the Rohan um, horseman, warrior, and get out alive. Okay, <clears throat> so the game is set up. Now we can start playing. Now at the beginning of the game, uh, our, our decks are already shuffled. Oh, and I should say... Now, I start out with a threat level of 29. That's because my three heroes, Glowen, Thalon, and Gimli, these three dwarves, and, you know, and I built this deck specifically with them in mind. I wanted to have like an all-dwarf deck, basically. Although, again, I didn't have quite enough cards available to me to really push that. But the more cards you get, the more flexibility you have. You can make themed decks, you can make all-girl decks, or all-Rohan decks. I'm trying to make an all-dwarf deck. But anyway, so... The, uh, the relative strength, Gimli is an 11, Thalon is a 9, and Glowin is a 9. So that combined um, is 29 points. That's why my starting threat was 29, although it's already raised twice because of those effects. And Jen, hers started 29 too because all her heroes added up. Now, at the beginning of the game, everybody starts with a hand of 6 cards. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and here's Jen 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Six. But now, the first thing you do every round is everybody gets to draw one additional card. So really, we start with seven cards. And, at the beginning of every round, our three heroes, or in Jen's case, two heroes, gather resources. And that's what these little tokens are. So, I've got three heroes, and so I gather three resources, one from each. Now, um, these, if, if you're at all familiar with Magic the Gathering or games of that ilk, these are basically mana. These are resources we can spend to play the cards we've got in our hand. And right now, from um, Gimli and Thalon, I've got two... These are tactics heroes. You can see this little icon on the bottom left. I've got two tactics resources and one leadership resource from Glowin, which is a purple as opposed to red. And Jen, she gets, unfortunately, only two resources because her horseman is captured. So she gets one lore and one, oh, I forget what that's called, spirit? Or what's that blue one? Oh, I can never remember. Dee, dee, dee. It's a uh, spirit. Yes, it is spirit. Okay. So Jen's got one lore and one spirit that she can use to play her cards. All right. So that's what happens at the beginning of a round. We collect resources. We draw one card. Now, the next thing we do is what's called the planning phase, where we can, you know, we look at our hand of cards and we start with seven. Let's see, so let me pull out my cards. Let me see what I got here. D -d -d -d. Um, all right. 
And at this point, we this is our only chance during the round, during planning, that we can play allies or attachments. I got one, two, three, three allies and two attachments I could play. Now, of all the cards I've got, there's three types. Allies, who you know become extra characters who help us fight and explore. Uh, attachments, you know, weapons and armor and 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 the mark of uh, the Duodane that we can apply that you know give us makes us more powerful and events one time things that just happen and then we discard the card and so right now i've got three resources and i can only because of the limits of this quest i can only even though i've got one two three allies i could only summon one of them which is uh, right so Oh, which is too bad, because actually, I've got enough resources. This veteran axe hand requires two tactics, and this snowborn scout requires one uh, leadership. I've got enough to summon two guys, but because of the limitations of the quest, I can only summon one of them. Or alternatively, I could do as many attachments as I want. Let's see, now, before I make any choices, I should really look at Jen's hand, too, because we should be planning and strategizing together as we make these decisions... Because, you know, maybe I've got a better ally, maybe Jen's got a better ally. Between the two of us, we can only put one ally into play. So let's see what Jen's got. Although Jen only has one ally, who she can't summon because she would need two spirit, and she only has one. So she can't summon her ally at all anyway, this Westfold Horsebreaker. So it's going to be me who summons an ally. So let's see, which one should I summon? Because we really should get some out. Um, because the more allies we have, the better chance we got. So I can't do the horseback archer because I would need three tactics, and right now I've only got two. But over the game, more and more of my resources can add up. So I can save up to do him later. Let's see. After, right, so the scout... The scout's got a cool one. He's a really weak character. He has no... Um, oh, I can never remember what all the names of the icons are. What, willpower. He has no willpower, no offense, and he only has one defense. But he has a special ability. When he gets summoned, he automa or, you know, he automatically places one progress token um, on one of the locations. And as you can see, there's two locations. We have to explore these locations to find Gandalf's map and the Endless Cat Rooms. Wow. In fact, if I summon him, he could immediately... Um, Right, to explore Tower Gate, we only need to make one progress. You can see the little one there. So if I summon him, we could... Yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm going to pay... Right, so he's the guy I'm going to summon. So he needs one leadership, which is what Glowin provides. So Glowin's one leadership is going to be spent, and we're going to summon the Rohan Scout. Okay, which again, you know, if... if if I had more cards, I might have wanted to make a Rohan deck, you know, and put Eowyn and, you know, and put the Rohans together. But again, I don't have quite enough cards to make really thematically strong decks. So there's going to be a lot of mixing and matching. But anyway, so I paid my one resource, and there is a response here. After Snowborn Scout enters play, choose a location, place one progress on that location. These are little progress tokens. There's two locations in play, the Endless Caverns, which requires three progress. You can see right there, it requires three progress to beat. And the Tower Gate, which requires one. Boom. We just finished the tower gate. The tower gate is done. We didn't even have to explore it because the scout went out and did it for us. Good job, buddy. And by getting rid of this now, hey, you know, we, we don't have to worry about this traveling effect. If we had traveled to the tower gate ourselves, um, you know, we would have we basically run into uh, um, some orcs that we would have to fight. But since the scout went and did it for us, boom, that's gone. And we now can find Gandalf's map. And remember, that's one, this is actually starting out pretty well. That's one of the things we need to do. We need to get one of these three objectives, and then we need to do nine progress before we can move on. So Gandalf's map is available to us. How do we get it? Ray, anybody can raise their threat by two to claim this objective when it's free of encounters. The scout just took care of that for us. When claim, attach Gandalf's map to a hero that you control. Counts as an attachment. Um, and the, but here's the thing. This is the downside to Gandalf's map. The hero we give this to cannot attack or defend at all. But we do need to get that map. Let's see. Now, my... Let's see. And let's see. Can I give this to any character? So I could give this to... Uh, let's see. Yeah, sometimes you can only give them to heroes, I think. Can we attach? Or no, no. Right, yeah, okay. This has to go to a hero. So... I think we're going to go ahead and find anyway. The scout went out, cleared that out. Boom, we're going to get the map. Now, to take this, we have to raise... Whoever takes this raises their threat by two. I'm going to give it to Jen, which raises her threat from 31 to 33. And remember, when somebody hits 50, they are eliminated from the game. And I'm going to give this to Gandalf's map to Eowyn. 
because she's not a particularly good attacker or defender anyway. She only has one attack and one defense. She's really good though. She has a high, high willpower, which means she's great at completing, um, you know, exploring and completing quests. So it just is a perfect fit for her to give her the map. And now she can no longer attack or defend, but that's okay because I was almost never going to have her attack or defend anyway. She was always going to be exploring because of her high willpower. Okay, so now remember, we're still in the planning phase where we get to play allies and attachments. I've played an ally, and I can't play anymore because of the special rules, but I could still play attachments. Let's see here. And I've got two attachments to choose from here. The Blade of Gondolin and the Dudane Mark. Again, my apologies for mispronouncing uh, Tolkien words here. Tolkien text. So, if I give, I can attach this mark only to a hero. Okay, both these can only go to a hero. The attached hero gains one um, attack, and if I ever want, I can move this mark from one character to another by paying more money. So I can give this temporarily to a hero and then give it to somebody else, or I could give somebody the Blade of Gondola. Now, they both cost one. Oh, wait, no, actually, the mark costs one leadership. I've used my leadership to summon him, so I can't play the mark anyway. But I could spend one resource of tactics to put out the Blade of Gondolin, which I think I'll do. So, attach it to a hero, restrict it. And now, I could attach it to any of my heroes or any of Jen's heroes. I could give this to Jen and put it, say, here on Glorfindel. Now, whichever character gets this gets plus one attack when fighting orcs, specifically. And that's a good thing, because we're going to be running into a lot of orcs. This tower grade, if we'd had to explore it, we would have run into orcs. And whoever gets this gets plus one when attacking orcs. And also, uh, let's see, after the attached hero attacks and destroys an enemy, place one progress token on the current quest. So, the Blade of Glorfindel, automatically, by beating um, monsters, uh, let's us make progress on our core quest. That's really awesome. So who should I give this to? I should give this to somebody who's going to fight orcs a lot. And that's pro let's see, my best warrior is definitely Gimli. That's why he costs me. He's, he's an 11 as opposed to a 9 like Thalon. So I'm going to give it to But I could give it to Glorfindel as well. Gl Glorfindel is an awesome, awesome fighter. Three attack right off the gate until Gimli um, powers up. Glorfindel is our most powerful warrior we have available to us. But he also has a very high willpower, which means he's very, very good for exploring as well. So I think I will go on ahead and give this to Gimli, because just as a general rule, Gimli's probably going to be um, our, a more re readily involved, more, more often involved in fights, because he only has a willpower of two. He probably won't be spending as much time exploring. So I've just given him the Blade of, what was it, the Blade of Gondolin. All right. By the way, this is a restricted item. Any character can um, have no more than two restricted items on them. All right. So now I've still got one more resource. I can't, I can't do my other attachment, but I've also got these events. I could play events if I wanted. Although, I say I can't play this one because this requires leadership. I've already used my leadership. I could play Blade Mastery, which means I can choose a character until the end of the phase. That character gets plus one offense and defense. So I might want to save that in case I get tr into trouble in combat. Now, Jen, she... Let's see. She, ha she drew one attachment, self-preservation, which requires a lore, which Glorfindel has. So Jen could put this attachment on somebody. Self-preservation is basically attached to a character, and as an action, you can exhaust self-preservation and heal two points of damage from that character. So this is a great way to heal. But now here's the interesting thing. G Gimli, the more damage he takes, the more damage he does. So I don't necessarily want him to get healed up. But Glowin is interesting, because every time he suffers damage, he basically gathers leadership resources. So, actually, the self-preservation, yeah, with like, I'm going to go on ahead and pay a lore token from Glorfindel to put self-preservation on Glowin. And then from now on, anytime Glowin gets hit by anybody and suffers damage, he will basically harvest resources so he can play more cards... And afterwards, with self-preservation, he can heal himself. See, Gimli, I don't want to heal him because I want him to be hurt because the more hurt he is, the more effective a warrior he is. That's his special power. All right. So now Jen's still got one resource worth of spirit. And let's see. So she could play Stand and Fight. She could play A Light in the Dark. No, that one's too expensive. Uh, oh, the Dwarven Tomb. So Jen could return a card from her discard pile. 
Let's see. Although she also has strength of will. If you travel to a location, exhaust a spirit character, which in this case would be Eowyn, and have two progress immediately placed on that location. So that's pretty handy. Oh, and this one doesn't even cost anything. So I think Jen's going to save this resource. She's not going to use it right now. She'll save it for, for something later. So we have now finished the quest phase. Or I'm sorry, no, the planning phase. We're all done planning. We're not going to play any more. And that's it. For the rest of this round, we cannot play attachments or allies. Now we move on to the quest phase. All right. And the quest phase is when we can take our heroes and characters and commit them to working on the quest of the Necromancer's Tower. Remember, we need to produce nine progress. And we also need to get one of the uh, special items, but we've already done it. Jen took the item. So now all we need to do is make nine progress on this and we will be able to move on to the next. So how many of my characters and Jen's characters are we going to tap or exhaust to um, to work on. Let's see, Je Eowyn is definitely going to do it because that's her special. That's her, what she's really good at. She can provide her. She has four willpower. That's potentially four progress we could make by having her work on the quest. Now the interesting thing is. Fallon, my, one of my warriors, he has a cool thing that when he commits to a quest, he deals one damage to every enemy that's revealed by the encounter deck. So I think he'll commit to it as well. He only has one willpower. He's not that great at it, but because he's committed to the quest, whenever bad guys come out, they'll instantly take a point of damage. And heck, maybe if we get lucky, they'll just get killed before they even bother us. So I'll commit him. So that means right now we have committed five total willpower towards making progress, but we need to do nine total. Now we could commit more. Um, I don't want to commit Gimli because he's a good fighter. <clears throat> see, I could commit Glowin, but um, let's see. Now currently there is only one bad guy we know about, this undead who uh, does two points of damage and has two hit points. And he's going well, he, uh, to come for somebody. He's going to attack one of us a little bit later in the round. Let's see. So if I have him come over here, He'll be able to do... You know what? What the heck? Let's go on ahead. Let's, let's go in for a penny, in for a pound. Let's push hard. Huh. In fact, yeah, let's commit everybody. Everybody is going to commit to try to push. Uh, so Glorfindel with his three willpower, Eowyn with her four, Glowin with his two, and Thalon with his one. So that, what was it? That's seven, eight, nine, ten. We are committing ten willpower worth to the quest of the Necromancer's Tower, trying to find our way to the Necromancer's Tower. Unfortunately, we've already got the map, so that's going to help. So, we've committed them. They are tapped. That means for the remainder of this round, they are not going to be able to defend in combat or attack in combat. They're all exhausted. But I have left the Scout and Gimli. These guys are still available to get in combat if we run into trouble later. Okay, so, after you commit your forces, um, then we, uh, we draw encounter cards because, you know, we've committed our forces. Now the forces of evil will commit their forces. You have to draw one encounter card per player in the game. We got two players, so we're going to draw two more encounters and we get Dull Gordur Orcs, which when revealed, the first player, that's me, I've got the first player marker, chooses one character currently committed to a quest, deal two damage to that character. Wow, okay. Well, I'll go ahead and make it Glowin. So Glowin just took two points of damage, but um, whenever he suffers damage, add one resource to his resource pool for each point of damage. So he just, you know, he took it on the chin and he just got two resources as well. And now the interesting thing is, because he's got the, what do you call it, the self-preservation, exhaust self-preservation to heal two damage on attached characters. So I'll go ahead and tap that now and he'll just heal those points right back. So that's not too bad. Pretty happy about that. So this was the first card we drew, the Dolgardur Orcs. And when revealed, they did that. Well, that actually worked out okay. And now we got to draw a second one, and it is the Great Forest Web, uh, which, is a which doesn't have any special effects when it comes out. Okay, but it's a place we can travel and explore. All right, so now we committed our forces. The um, Sauron committed his forces, and now we find out how well did we actually do in our attempt to make progress. So again, our total was three or four, seven. Um, what was it? Eight, nine. Was it ten? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten total. Right. I thought I had eleven, but I miscounted, obviously. So we have ten total. Let's see here. 
And what we now have to do is we have to subtract from um, our willpower the threat produced by all of these dark forces that are in what's called the staging area. So the threat is this icon right up here. This, uh, you know, so the great forest web produces two threat. So our total is two threat plus two, four, five, six, seven. So there is seven threat total. And what we have to do is we have 10 willpower minus seven threat means we have just made three progress. Three progress of the nine total we have to do. So that's the thing. When you're committing your forces, you don't know what Sauron's going to commit. You might commit forces and then Sauron ends up pulling out cards that are so threatening that you end up not making any progress at all. So that could be a very dangerous thing. But now here's the interesting thing. If we hadn't committed any forces at all, all this threat, the, um, was it, the two plus two plus two plus one, two, uh, four, six, seven, that would have been threat that we would have had to absorb on our dials and we would have been that much closer. So there's this delicate balancing act that's happening throughout the game. You're always having to explore, explore, explore. And even if you don't have a chance of successfully exploring because there's so many straight out there, you need to explore anyway just to keep the threat down because when our threat, token, or when our threat meters go to 50, we instantly get removed, you know, kicked out of the game. So, now, now, there's one other thing that's going on here. Aon has a special power. Action. I can discard one card from my hand, and actually all players can do this, to give Aon plus one willpower until the end of the phase. So now, if we want, both Jen could discard a card, I could discard a card, and we would add two more willpower and get five progress made. We should definitely do that. So I think we're both going to discard a card. Although that gets into, well, what do we want to discard? Let's see, Jen's got two stand and fights. I think she'll get rid of one of them. So that upped her Eowyn's willpower. So that's an additional success. And what am I going to get rid of? Well, I want all my things. Now the horseback archer is expensive. It's going to take a while before I get three resources. Although not necessarily. In fact, actually, I could get him out next turn. Because if I don't use this on Gimli, I'll get two more. So I'll have three. But I've got the veteran axe hand. I've got campfire tails. And I've got blade mastery. Those are all good things. The Blade Mastery can help me out if I get into combat and run into trouble. But right now, you know what? I think I'm doing so well. You know, Gimli, um, I, got, I got my ally out. But remember, I can only put out one ally per turn. The interesting thing about the Horseback Archer, he, um, you know, both these guys have two offense and one defense. But this guy costs one more because he's got a special power of ranged. And what that means is, normally, my guys can only fight people who have come over and attack my guys. But a ranged character can actually fight people who are attacking my party or can shoot at the bad guys who are attacking Jen. And Jen's in a bit of trouble. Jen has pretty much no defense. But all her characters are busy exploring, so they can't attack or defend themselves. So I think because of that, we definitely need this archer. So I'm going to go ahead and discard the veteran axe hand and save up for the archer instead. And that means one more progress. So we've done five of the nine progress we need to do to the Necromancer Tower. Okay. And so we have now finished the quest phase. Next we move on to the travel phase, and then we the encounter combat phase, and we're done with the first round. But wow, we're 33 minutes in, and I'm about halfway through the first round. You know what? I think this is actually a pretty good place to stop, because you guys have seen about half of the stuff. Um, we were doing adventures, but now, next up, we're going to travel, where we have the option, if we want to, to travel to the Endless Caverns or the Great Forest Web. Because if we travel to these, like, um, you know, if, if we travel to the Great Forest Web, that means we're, we're here, we have to deal with whatever, you know, um, when we travel here, each player must exhaust one hero he controls, but we take this threat off the board. So now there's less threat preventing us from being able to make progress in our questing phase. So it's always a good idea to take to travel to places and clear them out so we can make more progress later. But you know what? If you want to see the travel phase, if you want to see combat where we've got some orcs and some undead we could kill, you can hit the button that's on screen or follow the show notes and go to the extended play where I'll keep playing. And at the very least, I'll finish this first round and probably do some of the second round as well. I'll turn you can hit the other button and go straight to final thoughts. Your choice in five, Four, three, two, one.